Fiona. So let's see if this works, guys. I just started st the streaming five minutes before the, the time, so I'm just going to have a nice uh, <laughs> a chat with you before we start officially. I am in beautiful Krakow. As you can see here, I'm outside. I hope that uh, you can hear me. So let's see if you can actually hear me, which is the most important thing. I'm just going to ask you here. Can you guys hear me? Let's, let's start with this. We can hear you. Okay. Hear me. Let's, let's oh, start with this. Yes. Now hear I can me. I can hear myself on the iPad. So I have to mute my iPad before we start. This is these are the technical <laughs> technical problems of going live. Uh, hi Mickey. Hi Eric. Hi Thomas. Juan Byron. Okay, you can hear me clearly. I'm wearing this, so I hope this uh, works. The only problem I have is that I have an iPad just here, and if I speak, I have to mute it. But apparently, let me just check before I give it a try. I cannot mute it from here. I do not know why. But it doesn't matter because I can see the chat here, so I will avoid using my iPad. It's not the end of the world. So, um, great to see you guys. Um, Give me another second. Uh, okay, everything is fine. We haven't started officially yet, so this is some sort of chit-chat. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, Mario, uh, Thomas asks me, do you sometimes speak in, Argent in an Argentinian version of Spanish? I do not. I speak Spanish from Spain. Uh, I have a few Argentinian friends, but I've never... Uh, learn to speak Argentinian, Argentinian uh, Spanish, you know. Anyway, we still have five minutes to go. I see uh, there's quite a few of you guys coming. Uh, it's always nice to talk to you and to have a chat with you. Um, I, I kind of remember the last live video I've made was maybe, I'm not even sure, like six months ago, a year ago. I don't remember. I just checked that the last, the, the last one I remember or the last one I checked uh, was a year ago. It was like the 17th of July, 2022. So time flies. Um, so what I'm going to do, first of all, just a couple of things. Uh, this is a Q&A in English. You can ask questions in other languages. I just have to translate it into English when I, when I, when I say them. I'm just going to select, as usual, questions uh, from, from the chat that I see here. Um, and then, you know, we have 75 minutes, more or less, so one hour and 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, I'm in Krakow, I'm in Warsaw. Yeah, I'm, I'm here in, uh, in Krakow. Someone asked me, oh, how's, how's it going in Krakow? Pogoda je świetna, jak zawsze. The weather is wonderful, as, as always, Thomas. Well, not, not, not as always. It was actually kind of cold yesterday, but... Um, so what I'm going to do again, I'm going to see, look at the questions, uh, since I obviously is, as, as it is always the case, uh, while I answer, I see a deluge of other questions. I'll, I'll try to select, uh, the ones that I deem, uh, cool, appropriate, uh, interesting. Uh, Berta is going to moderate the chat. You can see, uh, she, she's very strict. She just wrote chat, two simple rules. She likes giving rules. <laughs> so, um, Grüße aus Deutschland. Uh, and um, yeah, I think we, we can actually start. Still three minutes, but I think I think at this point might as well start. So first thing first, first things first. Um, I wanted to uh, make an announcement. I'm gonna make an announcement now, and then I'm gonna say this again at the end of the video. Uh, I have this baby here, as you can see. It's, this is my Kindle, and th I, this is probably mirrored, but this says. 10 essential rules for smart language learning. So uh, two days ago, we actually started and we launched the book. This is my first book ever. It's uh, a very special package because it's both uh, in PDF and EPUB. It's a digital product, but oh, it also comes with an audiobook. I recorded this in Rome. Um, so we have the, you know, you have the book, you have the audiobook, and you also have uh, a series of interviews that come with the book. And um, Officially, we opened this, uh, we launched the book two days ago. The response has been amazing. Uh, hundreds of people have bought the book, and I've been overwhelmed by love and all these messages, and people, some people have already finished the book, and um, they're really uh, excited. I can see some comments from students of the uh, Smart Language Learning Academy. 
uh, like Jamie. Uh, so uh, this is very exciting for me. Um, and uh, this is a new beginning. This is a breakthrough in my life because I've been, you know, wanting to write a book for a long time and many more will come. Uh, but this one is a little bit special because uh, it's not just about my methods. And I'm pretty sure you guys want to know how I learn languages. Uh, but I believe that one of the most important, crucial aspects of language learning is your mindset. Uh, I think that emotions, mindset, the way you see yourself, the way you see the world, the way you see your potential as a language learner really plays a huge role. And basically the book is a story of my life, is a story of my life as a learner, as a human being, and how I've evolved when I was like 12, for example, and I could not even speak English, I could not even pronounce enough i used to say now <laughs> much to the to the horror of my uh, english teacher so i moved from a very insecure timid uh, speaker and learner to a confident person who speaks 15 languages and and again the, the i think the core message of the book is that anyone can do this uh, and the most important thing is your mindset first and foremost because you can train for methods There are so many people out there that share methods and share strategies, but you cannot train for mindset mindset is something that grows on you grows with you uh, When you have when you test your limits when you get out of your comfort zone and when you realize you finally realize the potential think about how how many limiting beliefs we have you know like Hey, can I uh, can I actually learn this language? Can I speak a language fluently? So there's a lot of questions that we have, a lot of doubts uh, that even intermediate learners have. Am I ever going to speak this language fluently? And they really make a difference. Um, the, the way you formulate the questions and the way that your mindset really plays a gigantic role. So again, this book um, is uh, a labor of love. It took a few months, <laughs> took a long time. With my wonderful team, we've put this together. And uh, for those who want to uh, get it, there's a promotion uh, for four days. It lasts until tomorrow, midnight. And you can get it at half price. It's the entire package. And Berta has just shared the link with you where if you uh, want, you can purchase the book until tomorrow. Uh, then we will have it at a normal price on the website. Uh, someone asked me here, you're going to have it in Italian. Uh, if the book goes well, First, we're going to put the English version on Amazon, so it's going to be paperback, uh, and uh, and then we're going to translate it uh, into Italian and Spanish. And I will read the audiobook. I will be very happy to read uh, both the audiobook in Italian and in Spanish. So, um, without further ado, uh, let's go to the questions here. So, let me go up because we had some interesting questions at the beginning. I'm trying to answer as many questions as possible. Again, starting from now, we have one hour and 50 minutes. So, uh, let's, let's get started. Uh, so, first of all, let me turn off WhatsApp because I'm getting a lot of messages right now. Um, encouragement Community Church. This is the very first question that, that uh, was asked on the like, top. I'm going from top to bottom. Uh, if you have an A2 level, should you watch uh, movies with subtitles uh, in your mother tongue? I would say yes. If you're, first of all, if you have, if you're an upper beginner, I would not recommend watching movies. I would rather listen to podcasts at, at that level, and then you build enough listening comprehension, enough skills to then tackle movies. Movies, news, they're more in the realm of, let's say, B2, when, you, when you're more like a fluent speaker, even between B1 and B2. Uh, when you have an A2 level, I would say I would stick to uh, podcasts uh, at that level or a little bit higher, uh, even videos if you want. For example, there's a series, Easy Languages, Super Easy Languages, they're perfect for that until you get uh, a good listening comprehension, and then you can move on to movies, to or to watching movies, and you can watch them, for example, with subtitles in your native language first, and then in your target language. Nowadays, you have things like Language Reactor. These are apps, or actually, Language Reactor is a Google Chrome extension that allows you to see the movie in both. We have double subtitle strip. You can see it both in your target language and your native language, which is amazing. So you have comprehensible input at its best. Uh, let's move on to the uh, second question. Vinicius asks, could you please talk a little bit about the use of the bidirectional translation for each language level, beginner, intermediate, and advanced? Do you keep applying it when you reach an intermediate level? This is an excellent question, uh, Vinicius. Unfortunately, I cannot delve into it like in depth. Otherwise, it would take three hours to answer this question. But the, the let's say that the short answer is no. I use the bidirectional translation the way I uh, show it and, and the way I teach it. 
um, in, in, at the academy, at the Smart Language Learning Academy, just for uh, the beginner level. Because uh, this allowed, like the way it's built, the, the main aim is actually not to remember stuff, is to fam get familiar with the language by translating back and forth. And then at the intermediate level, I don't, I, let's say I don't use it anymore. I just get, I, I use different techniques. The, the bottom line is to get, um, you know, exposed to interesting content and find a way to remember it. But at the intermediate level, I do it in a different way. Then I go back to translation, but I use a, te I use a technique that is called reverse translation that is used at a very high level. I've never shown this. Uh, I, I've just... Uh, trained my my ex students when I was a language coach uh, with this technique, and it's going to be in the in the third course in the third installment because we have built a course for beginners, the by direction translation. Then we have the overcoming the intermediate plateau, which is for intermediate learners, and then we'll build the um, the ultimate <laughs> installment or the third installment of the trilogy, which is how to move from fluent speaker to native like speaker and the reverse translation. Uh, is a technique that is going to be included in that specific course. Um, and so the, the bottom line to answer your question, uh, I use the bidirectional transla translation only at, at a beginner level. Then I, um, I don't use it anymore for, at the intermediate level. And then once I'm at the uh, advanced level, I use a variation of that as more advanced. So uh, let's take a look at some questions here. It is a pleasure to hear how accurate Lucas Polish is. Thank you, Tom uh, Thomas. I love I love Paul and I love spending time here. Uh, two days ago, a guy told me, "Oh, you, you, I cannot tell you're uh, you're a foreigner." And that you know, when when someone says that to me, I'm super excited. You know, it's a it's a big compliment. It's a testament to hours and and, and decades, I would say, of work. So um, let me see here. There's, do you sometimes speak in Argentina? In Argentinian version of Spanish, in an Argentinian, the Argentinian version of Spanish. I already answered this question. I was, I started learning Spanish from Spain, and my accent never changed. So um, let me see. Uh, Juan asks, "What do you suggest to do in case the directional translation? I guess that that stands for BFT doesn't work so well as in your case with Japanese. Well, I adapt it. Uh, so I." I still use the technique, but with shorter pieces of content. The, for example, if you're trying to translate a sentence that is too long, the, the technique falls apart a little bit, especially in Japanese and SVO, uh, SOV languages, subject for object verb, SOV, like Japanese. So I have to find a different way around it or use a different version uh, of it uh, because this, I think the principle still works, but you have to tweak things because languages are, are a little bit different. So every language offers unique, uh, let's say, uh, challenges, so to speak. Um, good to go too. Hey, Lucas, how many hours? Luca, my name is Luca, <laughs> and I live on the second floor. Here it's the third. Hey, Lucas, how many hours do you think I should learn daily and to build up a language core in a Slavic language, Ukrainian, in six months? I mainly learn through reading, through reading a lot and through YouTube videos. Well, first of all, the, the, the answer is, what, what is your native language? Because if your native language is another Slavic language, that makes it easier for you. Or if you have another la other languages under your belt that are Slavic languages, that facilitates your task. That's the first thing. But let's suppose that you're not, you your native language is not a Slavic language. I would say that in that case, um, in six months, if you want to build a language core, you, sh you should learn for at least, at the very least, one or two hours. There's always a problem that two hours can be very taxing for a lot of people. So I would start by learning for an hour, and then maybe you can scale it up. It all boils down to what you want. Like, if you don't have to rush the country because you have to work there or for other specific reasons that compel you to learn fast, then I would say that I would start, like, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I would just worry about... Um, learning every day for at least the first month, and then you can scale up. This, this is a secret. Start small and then scale up with time. Um, then let's see here. Okay, I already, I already read this question because I'm going from top to bottom. Jak tam w Krakowie, jestem w Warszawie, pogoda jest świetna. So, uh, Miki, can you reorganize our thoughts for can we speak more confident or how can we leave the translator? Mickey Catch asks, I guess you, you wanted to ask, how can you get confident when speaking a foreign language? I would say that one of the most important things I'm building as of now, by the way, 
um, another course, and I'm very proud of this because this is coming, coming out really well. We, we ran a poll within the academy and we wanted to know what's the next course that you, that you would like to see. Almost everybody said speaking. So we're building that and we're building a course on how to speak more uh, fluently. And one of the core ideas is that in order to speak more fluently, yes, practice, sure, that's important. But confidence and your mindset is really important. And the way mindset impacts uh, your interaction with other people is amazing. So if you think about that, we have people focus, a lot of people focus on how can I get better? How can I improve the way my vocabulary, my pronunciation, my uh, syntax? This is These are all important components of what we, we call uh, speaking skills, but I believe that communication skills are as, just as important as well as your confidence. So I think that in order to build confidence, one of the most important things is to have experiences in the language. So don't think about fluency just in terms of the words you know or the amount of words you know. That's an important metric. That's an important measure, of course, and component. But I do believe that the experiences that you have count counts. You know, so uh, your confidence grows when you're able to interact meaningful meaningfully with uh, other native, native speakers or people who speak the language, your target language, uh, in a meaningful way. The more experiences you have, the better uh, it gets. Every time you learn a foreign language, every time that you have to experience something uh, like ordering something, on, uh, for example, at the restaurant, you're scared. Everybody's scared. A lot. Nobody, nobody likes admitting that, but we human beings as adults, we're scared of new situations, something new. So uh, the way, the fastest way to build confidence is to face your fears. And I'm a little bit scared, you know, and I, I do it anyway. I still remember uh, when I um, was in Budapest, there was this grumpy lady, you know, Eastern style. She was very angry. And I, at the time, 2017, uh, my friend Alessandro and I, we had to go to another town, like not far from Budapest. And I told myself, oh gosh, I was literally sweating. And I was not sweating because it was August. I was sweating because I would like, I was dreading the interaction, which was actually kind of difficult because I asked her something in Hungarian, knowing that she didn't speak a word of English. She grunted something and then we managed to communicate. But after that, you know, uh, after that dreadful experience, my actually, I thought if I can make it here, I can make it anywhere. You know, if I uh, if I manage to survive this situation, I can manage to survive anything. And my confidence grew. And then I started talking, you know, like interacting in, in bars or and in, in restaurants and it all made a difference so remember confidence comes from um practice but also experiences so um let me see here now i'm reading the comments about exciting to read it way to go uh, very cool um i already said anna there's going to be an italian version uh let's see here let me go down my listening in english is very bad can you give me tips yes it's, it's the easiest tip is just to listen to stuff that you can understand as much as you can. So this is the most important thing. When someone says, I do not understand, it normally means you haven't listened enough. So you have to listen as much as you can. So now I'm going to go to the bottom and then up. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so someone says uh, they're learning Swahili. This is one of the languages I'd like to learn. That would be very cool. Uh, the next one is going to be Turkish, but let's see. Um, Adnan asks, I think I'm plateauing in multiple languages now. Is your intermediate plateau program suitable to be used in this situation, or is it useful to address only one language at a time? Grazie. Uh, you can apply to any language. The only problem I see there is that maybe you're, you're, you know, you have a hard time overcoming a plateau because you're tackling too many languages. This is a common problem that, you know, we tend to think the more languages I learn at the same time, the better. But in the long in the long run, if you think about it, it's actually better to do one thing at a time. There's a famous book that is called One Thing, the one thing you do. It applies to business, uh, but basically the concept applies to language learning as well. We are um, we think there are so many languages out there, you're learning one, but you're missing out on all the others, this FOMO thing, like fear of missing out. But the reality is that in my suggestion, I would actually suggest you can, if you want, you can, uh, the course works really well uh, for everybody who took it. There's all students here uh, who can tell you that because they, they are part of the program, but I wouldn't apply it to many languages at the same time because uh, then you kind of disperse your energy. I would apply to one language, see if it works, then, okay, I've overcome the intermediate, the, the intermediate plateau through the course, 
with this language, applying the method to this language. Okay, now let me try it. Let's try it out on another language. That's what I would do. Uh, then let's see here. How much do you understand languages that you haven't studied yet? Slovak, Bulgarian, etc. Well, this it happens that I had conversations in languages I do not speak, but I, for example, last year, no, it was two years ago, I was um, having a conversation with the Slovak parents of uh, my ex roommate, uh, flatmate actually, and I was speaking Polish, they were speaking Slovak um, slowly and we were understanding each other perfectly. So that 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 was great. Will Luca ever learn modern standard Arabic? That's possible. Uh, but I, uh, as of now, I want to learn Turkish and then we'll see. Um, so Daniel says, I tried to buy your ebook with my visa card last night and I couldn't try it several times. We, You can send me a message. We can figure that out later. There's a lot of you know, people ask me, how can I buy the book by through PayPal? Uh, so I address this one by one. If you send me a message, we'll figure that out. Do not worry. Um, have you read Atomic Habits? Yes. And I, I would also suggest um, Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg. So Atomic Habits is great. I have it in three or four languages. I, I bought it in Polish recently, and I would highly recommend it. And yes, I have integrated that into language learning and into my life. That and Tiny Habits. Um, and it really makes a difference. And this is what I teach also at the academy. It's not just uh, language learning, but it's the entire integration of habits, uh, you know, productivity hacks and language learning all combined. Uh, does Mandarin help impede you from learning Japanese? There's co two completely different languages. Um, I, I don't think so. Uh, I think that Japanese and Korean, I would confuse them at the beginning if I learned them at the same time. Or if I learned one and then five years later I would I, I learned the 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 next one, I think that would help. But Chinese and Japanese, like in terms of uh, pronunciation, they're completely different. So uh, no, they haven't interfered at all. So let me go up here. Luca, you're the best. Thank you so much. <laughs> do you think the shadowing technique and the shadowing technique can be useful to improve fluency in a language? And what do you think about using bilingual books to acquire vocabulary at an advanced level? Um, okay, two interesting questions. I think the shadowing is if I don't know if it's gonna help you with fluency, but it's uh, it can help you with articulation. So articulation is a part of pronunciation. It can help you if you know how to shadow correctly and you know how to apply the technique correctly. I think it can help you with articulation, which is part of pronunciation. And as far as fluency is concerned, maybe indirectly, but I think that when it comes to developing a skill, you have to practice that skill directly. And the best and fastest way to improve your fluency is just to speak the language. That's what I would do. So. I would say uh, shadowing is great for pronunciation, articulation. It's an exercise you can do five minutes a day or 10 minutes a day, but then practice speaking because that's what really is gonna move the needle, so to speak. Um, then let's go up. What do you think about Norwegian? I think it's a wonderful language, very similar to Swedish and Danish. I speak Swedish fluently, Danish a little bit less, uh, but Norwegian, I loved it, but I don't think I'll ever learn it, not because it's uninteresting, but it's very similar to, to, to a language or the two languages I already know, and there's so many languages out there that, you know, there's not enough time. Um, so why do you th why do you think there are so many language learning methods available in new apps or being created all the time? Why do I think that? Um, I, I don't know if, if, if that's what you wanted to ask, uh, Mamadou. Uh, yes, there's a lot of learning methods, but you know, as someone said, a very wise man said some, I don't remember, 200 years ago, principles are more important. Methods, yes, there are methods, but I think that the most important thing is to figure out what are what are the underlying principles that govern um, efficient second language acquisition. That is what counts. Once you understand the underlying principle principles of the process, then you can leverage those principles to create your own language learning recipe. That's what counts, you know. Um, Jordan, what methods can I use to get to a C2 level in my target language? I'm building an, another, that's the, as I said before, another course. That's a, a complex, there's a very complex um, question, Jordan. But just to, uh, you know, and very briefly, I would say that the way to get up there to the upper echelons of language learning is to constantly get out of your comfort zone and do things that are slightly more difficult and challenging 
uh, than your current level. That is what is going to help you uh, improve because uh, there's some a little something called return of investment. The more skilled you are with the language, the more effort you have to make in order to improve. So that's the reason why at the beginning it all seems like, oh, we're, I'm making a lot of progress, but then uh, then you stall for whatever reason. You plateau, you, you get into this plateau, and you have the impression that you're not learning. You are, but m much more slowly. So this gets people into... Like people get desperate, they say, oh, I stopped learning. It's not true, but you're learning much more slowly. So um, Cal, Cal Finnegan, I'm currently learning Greek, my beloved Greek, wonderful language. I'm using Asimil via French, but I need to know, I need to find more content to learn passively. Do you have any recommendations? Yes, I do. Greek is one of my favorite languages. I love it. Um, today I had a, a very nice lesson uh, with uh, my tutor, my Greek tutor. And uh, it's Greek is going great. I wanted to tell you something about this. I wanted to make a video about this, and I'll I'll share this in a second. Anyway, to go back to going back to what uh, to the question, um, Cal, um, for Greek, I would definitely get Easy Greek. Uh, I am pretty sure you know, and their podcast. Now, if you don't have a native language, there is something called American. Let me let me let me try to find it. American uh, uh, University Greek podcast that's what i use um learn greek podcast from the hellenic from the hellenic Ameri american union yeah i found it here uh i don't know if this is still uh working though i'm not 100 percent sure but there it is i just um shared it with you uh you should find all pot like an entire series of podcasts for free or uh, if you can't find those if there's not available anymore, I would use uh, Pod 101, Greek Pod 101. That's uh, that's a very good resource that you can use. You can have you can you can do the whole package. This is what I did. I finished Asimil. I used uh, Pod 101, and then I moved to I moved on to e the Easy Greek stuff. That is absolutely wonderful. I'm having a blast l listening to Greek every day. I'm going to Greece in a month, so I'm super super excited. Um, let me go up here. Um, let me see here. We got a discussion here between Berta and someone else about Chinese. Um, what is what is your opinion about tools like ChatGPT to learn a language? Um, I think it's going to facilitate some things. I've I've been using it a little bit, but I stick to the simple rule that listening and reading, reading and listening to stuff I like, is what is going to make a difference. the The problem with ChatGPT is that there's no audio. I recently found out that you can actually and I installed a Chrome extension where you can have ChatGPT talk to you. So there's like they, they literally, uh, let me see if I can find it here. It's called, uh, I can see the icon, but for whatever reason, uh, it doesn't, it's not telling me the name, but if you type something like Google Chrome extension, voice, ChatGPT, you will find it. Again, it's robotic. I prefer authentic content like people talking about interesting stuff or people having conversations or real authentic content uh, that you can listen to. That is what really going to make a difference. It's going to make a dent. Well, make a difference in your language learning. That is what is going to move the needle. You can use ChatGPT as a nice tool to integrate, um, you know, your language learning session, but I wouldn't let that, let's say, distract you from the main activity or the main activities. Language Language is a complex skill that is can be learned in a simple way. It's just that we make it much more complicated than it is. Than it is. Um, actually, listening and reading, reading and listening, and then just either reading or listening, once you have the capacity of you know either listening or reading, to authentic content, interesting, enjoyable, and understandable, comp comprehensible, is at the core of efficient of an efficient language learning routine or strategy. ChatGPT is nice. You can do some grammar drills. You can do maybe, I don't know, Anki or whatever it is, but that should be on top of this core. So you should spend at the very least 30 minutes, if you have time, on like listening to stuff you can understand that you like, reading maybe at the same time. Maybe if you have five minutes, you can use ChatGPT, depending on how much time you can invest in, in into language learning. This is what this is a, a you know a profound truth that I've, I've figured out just recently and it has completely revolutionized my language learning because before, well, maybe not revolutionized, but it really made it skyrocket because before I thought, ah, it's counterintuitive. You know, what's like, you have to read and listen to stuff all the time, but what about speaking? What about using the language? What about interacting with people? 
What about using ChatGPT? It's all fine and dandy, but I believe, again, that reading and listening to stuff has is, is never been easier than now. We live in an amazing era. We can find all sorts of things that we like. We can, we can select our own resources, and we can spend the whole day potentially, theoretically, listening to stuff we love. So um, let's see. Uh, Luca, how is your Danish uh, going? My Danish is not going because I stopped learning it, if I got to tell you the truth. I wanted to make a video about that because I, I think when it comes to learning or maintaining multiple languages at the same time, you have to make choices. Now, right now, my love uh, is I'm courting, so to speak, Greek, Hungarian, and, and most of all, Serbian. So uh, there's a lot of amazing things happening. I just... Uh, started uh, you know speaking serbian also sending messages on, on whatsapp um and uh, i'm learning it fast and uh and, and these are the three languages i'm focusing on and then i think okay danish what about japanese what about chinese what about so there's other languages that i cannot i i, I don't have the time nor the energy to tackle it's just you know thinking of trying to learn or maintain 15 languages every day is absolutely not realistic, not feasible. I would go crazy if I did, you know, if you if you do the math, we have 24 hours, I have to sleep at least seven or eight hours, and we have 16 hours, then what? Spend 30 minutes or 15 minutes for every language? It's not my style. I prefer using the languages that I know well. I, the whole, the entire goal of language learning for me is to have a better life. So it's not just, it's not just an intellectual pursuit. So when I speak language as well, that's the moment where I uh, I get excited. That's the moment where I talk to people and I have ex cool experiences and all that. That's what makes a difference. And, and and fortunately or unfortunately, I can do that in 10 languages, but five others, well, they're the, the, the proverbial so-called uh, back burner, and that's fine. So uh, let me see here. Uh, would you ever like to learn Romanian? Yes. Um, I In the book, I talk about that. I start with Romanian. The entire book starts with uh, why I failed, uh, well, maybe not failed, but why I stopped learning Romanian after, um, after starting it uh, back in the day. I don't even remember. It was 12 years ago, and I would like to go back. I would like to visit Romania. There's a lot of Romanians in Italy. They're lovely people. Uh, and uh, a lot of my fellow and uh, polygon friends speak Romanian, so they make me jealous uh, when I see them at the polygon gathering or other events speaking Romanian so well. And I tell myself, I want to speak Romanian as well. So this is gonna, this is bound to happen sooner or later. Uh, Nikolai uh, asks, what do you think about your recent visit in Poland? The polygon gathering was good. So first of all, I'm in Krakow, so I'm in Poland. I'm going to stay here until the beginning of September before flying to Greece. I love everything Krakow, everything Poland uh, in the summer because in winter it's a little bit shadow, I say, right? Smutno uh, shadow, powiedzmy. So it's just a little bit, you know, the Poles say all the time, oh my God, it's so gray here in, in winter and cold. I liked spending two, three, three months here um, in Krakow, uh, especially in Krakow, which is my uh, favorite city in Europe. And the Polygon Gathering was great. Every time I come here, I just have a blast. So to answer your question, I'm having a great, great time as usual. Um, <clears throat> so let's see here. Uh, what do you think about le language, learning languages with music? I think that... Uh, Costanza asked asked me this question. I think that's great. I think that that should be on top of what I said before. The core should be listening uh, to stuff, listening and reading to, let's say, reading and listening to stuff you like, like conversations and podcasts or short stories, stuff that contain language in your everyday life. Then on, if on top of that, you also like the music of, uh, you know, uh, if you if you want to listen to music, all the more power to you you know that's another activity that you can uh that you can engage in that is going to allow you to get exposure to the language any activity that uh where you were getting exposure to the language authentic language is great but it should come in my book on top of these other activities you can i don't think you can actually learn a language just by listening to music i know that this is not what you're doing but if i have to choose language is always about okay what do i do today i have an hour i don't want to spend my time with in a meaningful way that makes makes me move the needle, so to speak. I I wouldn't do that. I would spend time, as I did today, to give an example. First thing in the morning, I was listening to a um, a podcast in Greek, Easy Greek. I love I love these guys. So you have 
uh, real language between two people speaking. You have um, you, th this is this is what moves the needle. You understand how people talk to each other. L music, maybe you can do it while you're running. You're listening to, um, I don't know, the music uh, uh, spoken. Uh, you know, the, the the singer is singing in that language. That's fine, but it's something on top. So um, let me see here. Uh, there's still some questions from Berta going back and forth. You can't read Chinese out loud. Hey, Luca, I've been learning la two languages, but recently got a job in a new country. Uh, let me see here because it's changing very fast. It's, I have to scroll up and down. What should I do to not lose momentum when the two I'm already learning? I've been learning to let me let me reread this again. Anonymous user user. I've been learning two languages, recently got a job in a new country where I quickly have to learn the language. What should I do to not lose momentum with the two I'm already uh, learning? Well, you have to make a choice. You have to tell yourself how many, how much time do you have per day? And if you have, say, two hours, then great. You can spend maybe 30 minutes with one language, 30 minutes with the, the other language, so the two languages you're learning. And maybe the third one, you can spend the bulk of the time trying to tackle the third one because it's a new one. Uh, but then it depends on how much time and energy you have. Now you have to move to another country. Get, you got other fish to fry, so to speak. So either, you know, you drop one for a little bit, for three months, and you just exclusively focus on the language that you have to learn, and then you go back to the, the one or the two languages you're learning. There's a, there's a lot of options. It really depends on you. Uh, if you don't like dropping languages, but you're strapped for time and for energy, I would say, uh, you know, maybe you... You can learn both languages 15 minutes, 15 minutes, and then the rest of the time I would I would dedicate it to the language that you need to learn because you have to go uh, to uh, you have to you have to go abroad. Uh, let me see here. Oops, now went down. <laughs> so. Can you tell us about taking breaks in language learning? That's an excellent question. I like like athletes. You know, I really recently read this book. I don't remember the title to tell you the truth, but I think that athletes, especially top performers, they uh, alternate intense periods of activity, and um, you know, then they take a rest. I think the language learning. I, you know, I'm an advocate for learning every day, but I've I've come to realize the power of actually taking a break because no matter what. The brain gets momentum. So even if you take, for example, we organize these uh, three-month challenges, and uh, once they finish, we have a month uh, hiatus. Do you say hiatus? I'm not sure. Um, you know, a, a month, a 30-day break. The students are really uh, sad because they want to continue. Some just create their own worksheets, and now we have a notebook uh, challenge, which is uh, which uh, our student Diana created. So that's that's fun in August. Um, but I believe that, for example, I, I've been learning Serbian the entire year and I thought, okay, well, you know, these challenges are really, um, intense. And, um, we started the first one in January until, uh, the beginning of uh, April. I was actually glad that I took a break for a month, even if it might be sound crazy to the look of like two years ago or four year, three years ago, I might've felt guilty. And a lot of students shared this sense of oh i feel guilty for not for not doing greek or german or french whatever but i think that if you take breaks like short breaks two three four uh, days or even a week um especially when you go traveling or you have other things to do or there, there's a very intense period in your life for whatever reason i think it's totally fine as i said before ideas but the brain never stops learning so you give it food and the there's a slow digestion sometimes we stop learning for a while and we go back to the language we even better than before and we ask ourselves why stop learning well you didn't stop learning you think you stopped learning but your brain never stops learning your brain records everything your brain never forgets you give it the right food and the brain is going to do its trick and it's going to do it well so um there's still something going on between Adam and Berta here about Chinese. I cannot follow that conversation, unfortunately. Uh, when good to go to, when should one start to learn grammar more deeply? I'm advanced in French. I can speak about pretty much everything and understand the content that I like. Is, is it now time to learn grammar? Um, I would say gra you have to learn grammar all the time. It's not whether you have to learn grammar or not. It's how you learn it. From the, from the get-go, from the beginning, you start learning grammar, in my book, just by using 
uh, comprehensible resources where you get to get exposed to interesting dialogues and then you have some grammar notes that facilitate the understanding the comprehension of this content right uh, but I never I never opened a grammar book I, or b better I did when I was at school and I dreaded every moment of it when I started learning Russian I still remember I still have this this book this gigantic book right and I opened it and I saw these cases and all these exercises and I said, oh my God, just looking at it, right, uh, makes me dizzy. And that's not how you learn a language. You can, maybe for a scholar who wants to understand the intricacies and quirks of the, of the Russian grammar, that's fine. But that's not to learn a language. You learn a language by getting exposure to comprehensible, interesting content. Comprehensible means something that you can understand either because you have the translation or because you have, uh, on top of that, grammar notes that that explain or help you understand uh the these grammar points in in your case i what i would do good to go is um i would write um dissertations short texts and get corrections live you know maybe even indirect corrections that's one of the best ways to improve your grammar is by practicing or giving speeches and getting corrected um it's you learn by deduction rather than deliberate learning of grammar you can get into grammar like you can open a grammar book and try to learn but that's not a very good efficient way of learning grammar you learn to perfect your your eloquence and the way you uh, you speak uh, when it comes to grammar by getting feedback by getting out of your comfort zone and getting feedback let me give you for example uh, let me give an example so you can prepare a speech, it should be structured, it should have maybe three points, then you can just talk, you record your voice, you get, um, you should hire someone or you should have someone who can provide good feedback on how to improve the way you express yourself. I think that's the, you know, it, it's a little bit complex, but I think um, it's one of the best ways for me, most direct ways to improve the way you, you talk. Because grammar at the end of the day is how elegantly concisely we can express our thoughts so uh let me see here mm, maya maya hello from poland hello from back from poland from krakow i'm going to tenerife tomorrow i was in tenerife uh a few months ago absolutely gorgeous i'm i'm in the half of the spanish asimil so you're halfway i guess you might you meant that Spanish Asimil book and I have basics. What do you recommend to prepare yourself with ordering food and talking to people? Um, you can prepare some questions uh, or you can prepare some answers. But at the end of the day, I think the most important thing is just to relax and yeah, prepare a couple of lines, but uh, be ready to feel a little bit awkward if you don't understand something. You know, if you order something and then someone blurts something, the problem is more in understanding rather than speaking. Because you can always read something that you prepared or just show it to the waiter, just to give an example. But understanding is a different matter. We tend to think that in the interaction with, with a waiter, for example, is something relatively simple. But it's not because, the you know, you ask something and then the guy goes, like, boo, 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 right? And you go like, oh. I didn't understand. And then in that moment, you tell yourself, what do I do? Do I tell him I don't understand? I'm going to look foolish. Oh, gosh. And all this stuff. So prepare for the unexpected and the awkward. But if you're ready to embrace that, you're going to have a blast. So, yes, you can prepare questions. But when you have an A2, you're going to find it a little bit difficult to interact anyway. I don't want to sound discouraging. But you should, actually, especially because it's discouraging or can be awkward, you should give it a try. And when you actually um, manage to communicate you know, even Tarzan like, if you in Tarzan like language, that's great. That's a victory. That's that adds a little bit to uh, to your experience of, of learning the language or using the language of, of, of interacting with people in a meaningful way. Let me go down here. Um, let me see. There's a lot of interesting questions. What's your opinion about Asimil? Mario Milano asks, is that a good uh, is that a good tool to start with? Sfondi una porta aperta. I guess you're Italian. So with me, uh, I would say uh, yes. Uh, Asimo is one of the best uh, tools uh, in, my, in my book. Uh, speaking of books, the best resources you can find when it comes to uh, starting any language from scratch. Uh, so yes, I would say it depends, on the, it depends on the language. For Asian languages, it's not that great, unfortunately. But for European languages, I think you should give it a try. So let me see here. Hi, Luca from Ecuador. Hi, back from Krakow, Poland. Um, so 
Let me see. How do you keep myself from hesitating in a foreign language? I have a C1 level in English. However, when I speak, I find myself hesitating more than I would like to. This is a lesson I wanted to share. And um, I, I shared it with my um, with the people subscribed to the newsletter. So I've never really shared it here, I think, on YouTube. But um, I had uh, recently... Uh, or I tried to record a conversation with CZ. CZ is a, a YouTube a fellow YouTuber, and she makes um, Hungarian, you know, Hungarian content, or let's say content for Hungarian learners. Um, and then um, we recorded this conversation in Hungarian, and I was sweating, and I was just like, my mind was constantly going blank, and I was like, what am I doing? This what what this sounds awful. And she, I think she understood that too, that I was I was not able to, um, you know. I was having a hard time speaking Hungarian. But then uh, a few months later, I was in Budapest and uh, with my, my teacher, Petra, with whom I have normal conversations, I was speaking off the cuff, no problem, talking about everything without any major problem or hesitation. I believe that the reason why this happened, because my language skills were similar, both with CZ and it didn't change in a matter of months with CZ and, and Petra, but I think that the mindset with which I approach the conversation or any conversation in general makes a real difference. Think about that. If you are hesitating, it's probably because you think you're performing. You have to impress someone. You're in this in performance mode. I have to impress. I have to get a good mark. I have to, people have to be in awe of my skills or I have to prove that I'm good. This, um, I, you know, it's very complex to explain what happens in the brain, but basically this gets in the way. So your prefrontal cortex with which you're trying to, you know, speak and your emotional system, the limbic system, they're fighting with one another. That's why you're hesitating because your mind is tackling too many things at the same time. Uh, be water, my friend. You know, someone would have said, I, I think it's Bruce Lee. Be water means focus on just communicating. And if you focus on that, you will see if you start getting into that kind of mindset, you will actually see that you're able to say much more than you think and without hesitating. But it takes a little bit of practice and you have to get into that mindset. You're hesitating not because of your skills or not necessarily because of your skills, but more because of your mindset. Of course, if you're hesitating because you don't know words or you don't know expressions, that's one thing. But if you're at C1, I, I don't think it's a problem of vocabulary. I don't think it's a problem of grammar. I think it's more a problem of mindset, the mindset with which you um, approach a conversation. I don't know if you guys can write it on the chat. I don't know if this ever happened. Have you ever hesitated? Have you ever felt stupid? Have you ever approached a conversation with the will of impressing someone or of performing or getting a mark, you know, getting a good mark? So uh, this is a very important question or a set of questions that you have to ask yourself. When I speak, how do I feel? Do I want to impress or do I want to express? That's the difference. If you want to impress, well, okay, that's fine. But if you want to express, it's going to get, it's going to be a, a different new level. Think about that. Not impress, express, express your thoughts, express your emotions, talk about interesting stories, share your life, share your hobbies, talk to people for the sake of meaningful conversation, not for getting a good grade, not for getting praise, but to actually talk and communicate with people. That is what makes a difference. That is what should drive you to learn any foreign language, because at the end of the day, speaking a foreign language makes you connect with the world, and that is how it should be. Um, Carlos, do you use Wikipedia to read about specific topics? Yes, but I don't do it so much for when, when it comes to language learning. Uh, I don't do it so much to improve my languages. I on and off, I watch a movie, and then I like, you know, reading the plot. Maybe if I if I if I watch a movie in Polish, I'll read the the, the plot in Polish or in whatever language. But normally, I do it in English or in Italian. But it's more like for the sake of you know, uh, reading something interesting. I don't think about learning languages there. Oh, I get into Wikipedia to learn languages. Uh, do you use the bidirectional translation method for learning Mandarin? Uh, Jean-Paul asks, yes, yes, sir, I, I, I did. And it worked like a charm, especially for Chinese. Ch Japanese, a little bit different, but for Chinese, it was wonderful, both for learning how to type in Chinese and for tones and, and, and for learning the, the structure of the language. Uh, but truth be told, Mandarin Chinese is much easier in terms of grammar and structure and syntax than Japanese, which is a different ball game. Uh, let me see here. Um, El Informador, I'm a Spanish speaker. I want to learn to speak Chinese. How do I learn Chinese characters? Well, speaking and Chinese characters, they're kind of 
you know, you can speak Chinese without learning Chinese characters. My my recommendations I was saying before is you could use the bidirectional in translation, but if you don't know what the bidirectional in translation is, or if you don't know about the course I have, it doesn't matter. My my suggestion would be just to type sentences in Chinese. At, well, for, first of all, get a book that contains dialogues, right? Asimil is decent for uh, Mandarin Chinese, not the best, but decent. You get a foot to get a, a grasp, um, to get a, a let's say a solid foundation in the language. And then you, for example, can download uh, Pinyin. You can download the uh, the keyboard and you can use Pinyin. I would not recommend learning how to handwrite. If you want to, that's fine. I wouldn't recommend that. It's gonna, it's a skill on its own. It's gonna take hours and hours. If you wanna speak Chinese, I think you should aim at learning how to type recognize characters. And you can do that by downloading, for example, a keyboard. Uh, and start typing. It's fun. It's not even that difficult because, for example, let's say Zhongguo, right? Zhongguo. You just type Zhongguo literally, and then the 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 software program just transforms it into um, characters. So you learn to type. You can say it out loud when you type it. So your your brain is going to associate the sound Zhong with the transliteration and with the pinyin. Now, to explain the details, uh, it's gonna take a long time, so we don't have time to do that, but think about that. In order to speak, you have to learn, you have to get exposed to dialogues, and you have to understand these dialogues, and I would definitely get asimil, and I would avoid handwriting because it's gonna stop you dead in your tracks from the get-go if you try that route. But you're, know, you can do whatever you want. <clears throat> Carlos, what do you think about the use of mnemonics such as the memory palace in languages? Very interesting question. Uh, I am going through a, a course. Uh, I'm pretty sure that some of you guys know Jim Quick. He's pretty famous. So I'm doing one of his courses for, uh, you know, memory palace and uh, the Loki methods. I think it's in, in Italian it would be Loci. That comes from Latin Loci method. Loki. I'm not sure how you say it in American English. Uh, but Regardless of that, I believe that, you know, when people say, oh, in order to remember words, you have to associate with something or with a sound or I am not sure that these uh, mnemonic te techniques actually work because language learning is a dynamic skill that involves uh, something that is called procedural memory, apart from deliberate man memory in your brain. So language learning is not just about learning words so the bricks that make up the language it's also about associating these words to form sentences is much more complex than just remembering lists of words M mnemonics work uh, you know these techniques work uh, very well for memorizing certain things statically but i have never heard of a memory master who used these techniques in order to speed up the process of language learning maybe i'm wrong but uh, that's not I've, I've never used these techniques these techniques are interesting to train your memory to keep your memory you know, sharp, so to speak, uh, and I'm enjoying every moment of the course I'm taking, but to tell you the truth, it's more like for the fun of it, but for language learning, I don't, I don't see, um, I don't see how useful that can be, but I might be wrong. If there's someone here who tried these techniques and is, speaks languages like a pro, well, come to the fore and let's talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> is learning Dutch a way to learn Deutsch? <laughs> Interesting question. Well, if you know a language like German, it will help you learn Dutch. If you learn Dutch, it will help you learn German because they're similar. But only if you have learned one in good, well enough and you speak it fluently. In that case, it's an advantage. If you haven't formed a course, so to speak, so you have a like an A2 level, you're a beginner level at, say, German, and then you start Dutch, uh, good luck with that because you're going to confuse the two, the two languages. Do not learn two similar languages at the same time. Uh, that's my... Uh, recommendation that's something i i would avoid but then everybody can do whatever they want um okay so let me see here um in your live stream with stefano he told you anki is necessary for his georgian and japanese because oh i lost that question i don't know where he went <laughs> so let me see for his georgian and japanese because of the script do, do you really think it's necessary or can this be worked around i I don't remember having a, I don't recall having a conversation with Stefano talking about Anki uh, being necessary for his Georgian and Japanese, maybe. Uh, but I don't think it's, Anki is necessary to learn any language. But if, again, if you like using Anki, well, that's great. 
Um, I don't think that, that even for languages such as Georgian or Japanese, it's Anki is necessary. To me, uh, getting exposed to interesting content is what really counts. Interesting, comprehensible content for a long period of time, every day, possibly for 30 to 60, even 90 minutes, that will do the trick. If on top of that you like using Anki, why not? But, you know, it's up to you. I've never used it. To tell, well, I, recently to make a video, I tested it for a little bit. Uh, but it was not my cup of cake. Can you say that? Cup of cake? Not sure. Cup of tea, actually. <laughs> anyway, so um, let me see. Uh, Juan, hi, Luca. A big fan of your channel. What's the best approach to accent reduction in English? The best best approach to accent reduction is ac accent foundation. That means that when if you've been speaking a language for quite a long time, then trying to reduce your accent, good luck with that, because it's like a knot, you know, just like we're good at learning, we're very good, we're not very good at unlearning. So you have to undo everything you've done, all the patterns or the language patterns, and that's very tough to do. So uh, I, for everybody who asks me, can I reduce my accent? I always tell them you can, but it's a lot of work. If you're an actor, you have to work in Hollywood. Like, uh, I think Marie Cotillard, I think that's a French actress who didn't speak English that well. Now she speaks it really well. She had her coach. She had a lot, a lot of money to spare and to spend. Um, then, yes, but uh, I would say um, if you want to speak a language well, I think you should pay attention to its pronunciation. You should be interested in, 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 in pronunciation from the get-go. So if you've been speaking any language for five years or ten years or seven years, whatever, and you have a very thick accent, is, is going to be extremely difficult uh, to change that accent. I have, I, I had in the past as a language coach, but also as an accent coach, people came to me and said, "Hey, can I can I speak like a native?" I, I still remember to this day an Indian guy who had been living in the U.S. He had a very thick accent, and there was we tried a few things, but I already told him from the get go, "This is not going to change." But he insisted he wanted to do the training, but it, it's really it's really difficult, unfortunately, to reduce your accent. Um, I, I believe everybody's good. Everybody is potentially good. Um, at, potentially, we can learn to speak any language really well, maybe not get a native-like accent, but close. But it's a matter of paying attention of interest and a number of other factors. And rare are the individuals who actually pull that off. I don't think it's even that um, that interesting. Uh, well, that that well, it's interesting, of course. It's, it's not even that important of a goal the important the, the most important thing is just to to be understood to have a very clear pronunciation that's important the native like it's more difficult oh let's see andrew hungarian has a fearsome reputation but for a native english speaker is it that much harder than a slav language i always talk about this with petra who's my uh, you know the hungarian teacher i talked to before it's just different hungarian is not necessarily uh a difficult language it's very diff it's very different so it takes time to adapt to the system but there's a lot of actually refreshingly easy features or simple features or let's say um, features that you can learn uh, much faster than other languages so it really depends I don't think we, we as a native English speaker can compare Hungarian Slavic languages every every language has its difficulties and I've heard and met people learn Hungarian very fast by the way I'm gonna make a, a YouTube video interviewing a guy who learned this language amazingly fast and he had a he's a cool very cool guy Toma and uh, some other people learned Slavic language really well really fast or faster than Hungarian so uh, I would just say if you're interested in the language and if you do the right things and if you learn for two three four years and you got a chance of using the language in a meaningful way it doesn't matter what it's more important it's more difficult than than Russian or Slavic languages that's you have, if you focus on on that language and you really want to learn it no language is impossible to learn if you really want to learn it and you want to use it so, um, Reggie, hey, Luca, my personal language learning experience very much supports the fact that listening and reading are key to acquisition and the stuff about mindset is fundamental for fluid speech. I, I'm glad that you agree, uh, Reggie. Um, recalling vocabulary and speaking is a big struggle for me. Any tips on how to improve language output when there is no one to speak with? Um, you can talk to yourself. Um, I think one of the best ways uh, of 
the, the, the fastest, coolest ways of actually uh, getting to speak without having to talk to native speakers is to talk to yourself. I do this all the time. Now, I cannot show you the notebooks that are inside because it's, it's a little bit messy. But basically what I do is that when I have conversations with my tutor, but even when I listen to a podcast, for example, I jot down a couple of sentences, bits and pieces uh, of language, and then I talk to myself, try and explain uh, you know, the content of the podcast to someone. And that works really well. It's called the explanation effect. And this you can apply to anything. It's one of the most uh, useful techniques when it comes to reading and understanding what you read. You read something, you try to explain to your, to explain the content to your imaginary friend. So it's not just for language learning, but when you do it for the sake of improving your foreign language, that's even more powerful because you're talking to yourself, you're using um, words in context, and you're applying, activating the explanation effect. That is what I would do. It's not that you're not good at re re recalling vocabulary. It's just a matter of practice. So here also the language you use is really indicative of the kind of mindset you're in. It might be, oh, I'm not good at recalling words. Am I bad at it? No, you're not bad. It's just that you, know, you have to, look, to find a way to activate your vocabulary. And, uh, and recalling, speaking is, an, is a constant act of recalling in context. That's the, amazing, that's, that's the amazing truth. So if you get to practice either with yourself, talking to yourself, or with other human beings, even better, then you're gonna you're gonna be you're become, gonna become extremely good at recalling. I promise you that. So, um, hi Luca. I'm learning two languages and find it difficult to keep up. Miguel says, I feel like I don't have time to speak, write, and consume content for both languages. Any tip? Well, my tip is to step back, learn one language to fluency to B2, and then learn the other one. That's what I would do because if you're tackling too much, if you're like if you find it difficult to keep up, it means that you're losing steam and you don't want to lose steam so you can like in the, put one in the back burner this doesn't mean you're going to abandon it maybe for two months you're going to pursue just one language you get good at it or you get better at it and then you come back and and uh and you know learn the other language or you scale down and maybe you spend 10 minutes 15 minutes on one language 15 minutes on the other language you're going to learn more slowly but it's a matter of compromise you have to make choices in love in in life uh D Tao, I think. Uh, D Y D I Y Tao. Ever try Finnish? Never tried. Fascinating language. One day, why not? Mm. Mohammed, very interesting question. Did it happen to you to feel frustrated when you don't understand natives? Yes, that's one of the things I talk in, um, in one of the videos that I made about the book. Is that uh, when I was twelve, I was crying. I was watching it. Uh, a, uh, a movie and I was crying because I didn't understand. So that was the biggest frustration that spawned this language monster. I told myself, it's not like there must be a way to understand this. And then, so the answer is yes. And I still, to this day, sometimes um, this happened recently. I was, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm getting better and better with Greek, but I was listening to the news that were talking about the Fotiats, that were talking about the wildfires happening in Greece, unfortunately. And um, I told myself, I didn't understand, that, like at certain parts are a little bit too technical or they talk about politics I don't understand and I get frust frustrated. And I tell myself, how is it that now I understand almost everything with these easy, pol easy sorry, easy Polish because I'm in Poland, easy Greek videos and the podcast and everything. And then I get lost when I watch the news or maybe when I watch a movie and that's totally normal. So frustration and struggle and insecurities and doubts, they're part of, they're part of the path. And uh, I talk about this in the book, biggest frustrations. I, I think the biggest victories come from also the biggest frustrations, at least in my case. So uh, let's see here. I'm sorry if I'm skipping some questions, but unfortunately I wish I could answer, but that would require the whole day. Uh, thank you so much for all the amazing questions you're asking. I, uh, I love every single question. Um, Nadia says, boosting my vocabulary is one of my biggest issues. I think a lot of people focus too much on vocabulary and how should I improve my vocabulary. The focus should be on having fun and consuming content that you like for a long period of time. Vocabulary will come as a consequence of that. I think the biggest problem that a lot of learners have is that they focus too much on the wrong things. Like, I have to learn all these words. No, you have to. Yes, of course you have to learn these words, but you don't have to worry about learning words. If you're doing the right things, if you're exposing yourself to the right content, if you're listening to stuff you like, if you watch movies or you watch videos on YouTube that you like and you're paying attention, maybe you're scribbling down stuff, 
you will start remembering. You have to remember this. Your brain is never the same. So the more you expose yourself to the language, the bigger the, infra the mental infrastructure, your intellectual linguistic infrastructure is going to get in your brain. And the more knots and points of reference it has, I see it as a spider web getting bigger and bigger and these flies that are words, right? Like these flies going around, they get stuck in the net. So the, the more exposure you, um, you get, the better you will become at remembering words. Something that doesn't stick at the beginning will stick much more easily and even on the fly without you having to do any deliberate effort because of this, of, of this infrastructure that is slowly building in your, in your brain. But the main focus should not be, uh, I have to I have to build my vocabulary. The kids don't learn like that. They don't think about words that they have to learn every day. They just learn them by using the language in a meaningful way, interacting in a meaningful way, and getting exposed to a lot of it. So another question about Arabic. Yes, I'd like I'd love to learn MSA and I'd love to learn uh, maybe Egyptian, uh, Egyptian uh, Arabic. Let's see. Uh, but for now, my choice now is, is you know, I'd, I'd love to learn Turkish in January, Hebrew, and then maybe Arabic. There's too many languages to learn. Anyway, have you ever been interested in career and the career of translation, Ito? Yes, I was at this in, in, in Paris. Uh, I, I wanted to pursue a career as a, a conference interpreter rather than translator, um, but that uh, didn't cut it. And I ended up doing something different. And I'm very happy that I did not I do not work as a as a conference interpreter not because it's not an amazing job it is but it's a little bit stressful and I prefer being an entrepreneur helping you guys and training you guys to learn languages better and more efficiently so um anonymous user oh you were that was an interesting question but now again the chat disappeared uh, la la la. Let me see. Okay. Hi, Luke. I've always been curious. How do you decide that you know a language well enough to consider it learned? I emphasize the quotation marks and allow yourself to begin learning a new one. Very interesting question. And it's a very good question for polyglots. I would say the, the simple answer is I consider, if you, if you consider the CEFR, Central European Framework for uh, Languages, this is a European framework, I would say B2 as a level where your language core is formed and you move from learning the language or trying to study the language to using the language and it's going to be very difficult for you to forget it. If you don't reach that point, there's a high risk that your language core is going to shrink and you're going to forget uh, that language, especially if you reach maybe A2 and then you stop learning it, well, then you're, you're completely going to forget it. So uh, that's that's my point of reference. And you never stop learning a language, but I consider that threshold when you ha have reached that level, when you have reached those skills, that, then you, I consider that that language is, um, has become part of my repertoire of languages that I can use in a meaningful way. Uh, let me see here. Uh, your view on AI to help language learners. I talked about that before. I think it's a, it's an amazing tool. It's a, it's a, an additional, it's an add-on, an additional tool that you can use in order to facilitate the acquisition of language learning. I believe that we use, you know, we're talking about chat GPT, but AI in a way it's been around for a long time to like, in a way, DeepL or Google Translate, this is artificial intelligence. And I use Google Translate extensively, especially DeepL. Now, even DeepL write in order to create content that is comprehensible for me. That's what really makes a difference, you know. And, and now you have Mac Whisper uh, in order to, you know, you can listen to anything. And this thing creates a transcript even for videos or a podcast that you for which you don't have any subtitles or it, it's amazing this is what really counts for me is like ai is helping us creating comprehensible content um and ChatGPT is another tool uh that you can use that you can add to your toolbox to learn even better but again the core is always the same and it's always listening or reading reading and listening to interesting stuff if ai is conducive to creating interesting comprehensible rich content then fantastic so uh, let me go down where we have, uh, we have here a 10, 15 minutes to go. Um, what do you think of Duolingo? Is it worth it? Is, I, I've, I've, I've been asked this question all the time. Like when I go to these language meetings, hey, how do you start this language? Oh, I've, I've been using Duolingo. So that's a very common thing. I've never used Duolingo. I think it's not a very, uh, let's say acquisition rich tool, but again, I don't know it. So I don't want to talk about stuff I don't know. I think the merit is in 
um, helping people get started. They do something every day, but that should be at the, at the very end of your language learning session. So just to give an example, if you have 30 minutes or maybe 45 minutes to spend on say Dutch or Mandarin Chinese, you should spend 40, 40 minutes um, reading and listening. Again, this is a central point to stuff that you can understand that is nice, that con it has context, maybe a real dialogue of two interesting characters talking about something interesting. Then if you have five minutes, then you can spend five minutes uh, playing with Duolingo. But uh, if you just use Duolingo because you have 20 minutes a day and you think, oh, I'm smart, I'm doing Duolingo while I'm sitting in, uh, the, I don't know, you're sitting in the bathroom, you're doing Duolingo for five minutes, it ain't going to cut it. It's not going to work. You need to listen to authentic content for a long period of time. And, you know, if you if you want to, if you want to use Duolingo, that then great, but I would not use it because the time is limited and you want to spend it in a, in a wise way, so to speak. So um, let's see here. Um, let me see if you have any other interesting questions. Actually, you do. Uh, some people say that AI will replace translators and interpreters. What is your opinion on that? The career will no longer exist. I think that there's a need for human contact anyway. So I think it's going gonna, it, it, it's gonna to be around. I don't know for how long, but it's possible that translators might... I, I think the translation... It, machines might get very good, but translating is interpreting. And I don't know uh, when it is going to happen. The machines are going to be able to interpret a message. Translating is not... It, it, you know, apparently is, 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 a, is just a mechanical thing, but it's not at all. It's, it's, it's the art of interpreting messages uh, and uh, conveying, you know, one message from one language to the other. Um, uh, there's a famous linguist, Italian linguist, that talked about that. Dire quasi la stessa cosa. Say almost the same thing by Umberto Eco, who wrote an entire book about the beauty of translation and why uh, why translating is an art, the art of interpreting messages and transferring one message from one culture to the other. Um, someone said Duolingo worked for me, uh, just that it shouldn't be the only application you use to learn language. That's correct, uh, Larry. Um, if, you, if you like using Duolingo and it helps you learn the language every day, that's fantastic, you know, but it shouldn't be the only one. It should be one of the tools that you use where the, the most important activities are not playing with an app, but they're, you know, the, these activ the activities that I told you about before. And I've been insisting on that for the entire hour here. So um, let me see. Uh, why are you learning Serbian and is it hard for you? I recently met a, a, a girl from Croatia who was, I wouldn't go so far as to say she was angry, but she asked me, why are you learning Serbian? She was quite surprised. And I said, well, because of the history of the Balkans. When I was a little kid, I... I still remember I was reading the news, the you know La Repubblica, this Italian newspaper, and I was um, horrified by the war, but also fascinated, as fascinating as I was horrified at the history of the Balkans. And let's not talk about geopolitics here, but uh, the Serbs have always been portrayed as the bad people, you know. And when I was in Serbia and I, when I was in Croatia, I found the atmosphere quite different. I um, I love, you know, both uh, Croats. And Serbs, uh, but in general, I've I connected more with with Serbs than Croats, than uh, Croatian people. So uh, that's why I decided to learn Serbian because I find it fascinating. I find it a fascinating culture. There, I connect with them. I had a great time when I was in Belgrade, and uh, and then that's why I wanted to learn a uh, language from the Balkans, also to understand the culture, to understand. I have a lot of books about uh, history, especially about the the Balkan Wars, and. Um, and now I have the capacity of interacting and speaking with, these, uh, with Serbs, and uh, I'm excited to go to Serbia. I'm excited ab uh, about going to Serbia, about the idea of going to Serbia. So, uh, have you tried the Asimil, the digital Asimil version? No, I'm a, uh, someone called me Don Papel, which means, <laughs> uh, you know, paper, paper guy. I love paper, so I've never used that. Uh, but if you like it, you wanna, if, if you want to, if you want to use it, then by all means, um, go for it. Tom asks, no, not Tom, Francisco de Leon asks, Dire quasi la stessa cosa. I think that's the title by Umberto Eco. Uh, that's the title of his book. So um, let me see here. How do you choose books appropriate to your language level? That's a fantastic question. 
Um, so again, we have seven minutes, seven, eight minutes. Uh, let, me answer, let me answer two or three other questions. Um, so first, Daniel, have you ever considered learning Czech? I have, I might learn Czech uh, in the future. Going back to the, the previous question, um, which is, uh, let me see here about the books. Um, yes, normally uh, what I do is I try to learn, I try to go through as many podcasts and many videos as possible to, to get to a point where I can comfortably read a book. Um, but, you know, reading a, a novel or no, even nonfiction is tough. You have to reach at the very least a B2 level. Sometimes it's not even, uh, it's not even sufficient. So, um, my technique is very simple. Open a book, read a page, and look at how many words you uh, you do not know, and and check um, if you can actually understand at the very least the gist of it. If you if you don't, that means that that book is uh, is not at your level, and you should should scale back. If on the other hand you understand. Maybe you miss some parts, but you understand the gist of it. Maybe let's say 75%, you can go through it. It's going to be a little bit painful, but uh, you can give it a try. So uh, I could make it. Actually, it's, a, it's an excellent question for an entire video. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jot it down a little bit later, and uh, I'll think about how to answer it more thoroughly. Um, I think we're about to finish, guys. I can see there's a lot of interesting questions here. They're piling up. Remember that you can either ask them the next time. I'll try to make these live uh, events if you find them useful a little bit more often. Uh, I normally, the live events we're doing, we're doing that of the Academy. We're having a blast every every month. We, we meet and we have these discussions about language learning and about mindset, and they're very useful. Uh, and I really like them, but, you know, the, the, the reason why I haven't made these live, um, you know, events uh, that often is just because running now a, a, a company and a school uh, is a little bit taxing. So we have a lot of things uh, to, to tackle, but uh, I, I, love, uh, I love these live events. They give me a lot of energy and thank you for the amazing questions. They give me a lot of ideas about uh, some other YouTube videos. Anyway, um, is there any app that you recommend for taking notes effectively? Um, I would say I would use Remarkable if you uh, know or heard about Remarkable or just use notebooks. I use notebooks and old paper and pen. I think it's really powerful. Uh, that's the, to me, that's still the best way, the best technology we have in order to remember words. If, you, if your aim is you know, remembering words and practicing is just to um, jot things down on a piece of paper. Uh, for example, I've been experimenting with listening to a podcast and um, every 10 seconds writing two or three keywords. And that makes me super attentive. Like I pay attention like crazy. My level of attention is amazing. And also uh, I remember words much better. This is a technique. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't have time now to explain the technique, but it's one of the best techniques that I've, I've, uh, I've created in order to, uh, improve my listening comprehension, uh, you know, improve my attention, concentration, and vocabulary. Um, so, um, Islam says, how do we learn an accent perfectly? Well, it's a lot to say about, there's a lot to unpack, uh, you know, when it comes to that question. Anyway, so guys, I, ha I, I think we're about to finish. I just wanted to tell you again here, um, I just wanted to tell you that I'm, First, I'm really happy that a lot of you showed up. Very nice. Um, it's always lovely to connect with you. Uh, and uh, again, um, this is the book. In case you're interested, for over the next two days, we're gonna we're selling it at half price. It's not just the book; it's the audio book that I recorded. And um, and then uh, there's an entire series of questions, uh, of interviews behind the scenes. I share. You know, you see me normally here on YouTube, like this guy who speaks a bunch of languages. Maybe you think I'm super confident and everything. And I, I think I am, but, you know, I share in the book, I share a lot of personal stories. I share a lot of struggles. I shared a lot of insecurities. And I think uh, the central idea of the book is that anybody can learn a language, one, two, three, four, any language, actually. 
Um, and that at the end of the day, I'm not the superhero, super genius. Really, just when I say it, I really believe it. I was a disastrous school learning English and French. You should have seen me. Like, oh, is that Luca Nampariello? It's this guy who speaks a bunch of languages. I was just a disaster. And I believe that what really changed is my mindset. I started to believe. I think that when you start believing, uh, you start doing, you start improving. Um, we are limited by our own, our own limiting beliefs. The, the, the beliefs are learned. Think about that. You have learned like the limits that you entertain in your mind when it comes to language learning, but when it comes to anything, there are limits that society has imposed upon you. Like if you learn to question the stuff and you start taking um, a stand and you start taking a stance and like reflective, like you think about, okay, well, I'm insecure. Why? Why is why is this happening? I'm hesitant when I speak. I don't remember words. I'm not good at grammar. Think, think about. I, I'll leave this as a task for the next time we talk. Think, like, start to be aware of how you write, how you express yourself when it comes to language learning, and when you talk to yourself or talk to others about your own experience as a language learner. Right? Like when you find yourself saying, find yourself saying, I don't have the time, or uh, I'm not good at grammar. Or, oh, you have to live in country, you have to get yourself a boyfriend or a girlfriend to speak the language fluently. Or you have to learn grammar from the get-go. Or, Jesus, everybody's going to think I'm a fool when I speak. So think about that because these are limiting beliefs. These are, this is what's really stopping you from learning a language fluently. It's not grammar, it's not words, it's not, um, you know, the complexity of a language. You can learn any language. You've done that yourself. You've learned your own mother tongue. If you learn your own mother tongue, it's just because you went through the process in a natural way. You can replicate that in a second language. But one of the most important components is your mindset, your approach towards language learning, towards other people, and most of all, towards yourself. This is at the core, the message at the core. Um, and that's the reason why I'm, I'm proud that I got this book out. It's it's full of techniques. Yes, of course, you can learn the, you know, some of the things I talked about now briefly. Yes, we only scratched the surface, unfortunately, uh, due to a lack of time. But most of all, I share my path, the, the, the mindset, the transformation that happened. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's worth sharing. Anyway. That's it for now. Uh, you're going to find, just in case someone missed this or is going to miss this, or you will find the recording on YouTube. You can also see the chat, you know, uh, in the, the, the live section when you watch it later. Got the whole package. Thank you so much for all the interesting questions. I see here other very interesting questions that I will note, uh, I, will, I will jot down, and I will answer either in the next live session or uh, in the form of some brand new YouTube videos and there's more coming. Thank you so much, as always. Thank you for watching. And as always, happy language learning and bye from me, from Krakow. Bye-bye. Ciao. <laughs>